Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. George Van Buren. Um, I am a pancreatic surgeon and surgical oncologist uh, here at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And I work at the Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center, uh, also located here in the Texas Medical Center. I would like to welcome all of our uh, physicians and attendees from Latin America, the Middle East and the United States. Um, as part of our mission, uh, here at Baylor College of Medicine and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. One of our goals is to pr promote medical knowledge through educational programs. And this international center uh, at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center is thrilled to produce our 13th international virtual grand rounds table discussion. Uh, this is a network of physicians and medical societies and international medical societies uh, that we have uh, on these uh, telecommunications platforms where we're able to discuss these controversial and interesting topics. Today's topic uh, is IPMN, or Introductal Papillary Mucinous Neoplasms. Uh, it will be presented today by Dr. William E. Fisher. Allow me to explain the format of our presentation. So throughout Dr. Fisher's presentation, you'll be able to freely submit questions via the chat box, and we will be monitoring that throughout the presentation. Post presentation, we will open up for a virtual grand rounds ta open table discussion uh, with our commentators as well as our audience members. And it is now uh, a privilege for me to introduce Dr. William E. Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a professor and vice chair of clinical affairs in the Michael E. DeBakey Department of Surgery. He is also the director of the Elkins Pancreas Center at the Baylor College of Medicine and Dan L. Duncan Cancer Center. He is chief and head of the surgical service line at the Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. He's an internationally known pancreas surgeon. Uh, and as the professor of surgery and vice chair of clinical affairs, he participates in a wide range of both clinical uh, care, educational events and research. He has been a member of the Baylor faculty since 1998. And, and since that time, he has built one of the largest pancreatic programs in the country. Uh, he's internationally known for his work uh, both as a pancreas surgeon as well as a pancreas researcher. Uh, he has be, can, been continuously NIH funded um, for an extended period of time, uh, and he helps coordinate uh, all of the pancreatic research that occurs at Baylor College of Medicine and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. He is the principal investigator uh, for an NIH consortium for the study of uh, chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer. So it's my honor uh, to present Dr. William E. Fisher, who will be leading our discussion on the topic of IPMN, Introductal Papillary Mucinous Neoplasm. Well, thank you very much, George. And it's a, it's a privilege to get to present to this group. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, hopefully a, um, an inform informational discussion uh, with the group um, on this uh, topic. So uh, IPMN, or Introductal Papillary Mucinous Neoplasm, is of great interest to uh, pancreas surgeons. Um, you know, George and I have spent the majority of our career uh, doing pancreas resections, and, and we know that in patients with pancreas cancer, it's rarely a cure. Um, even when we catch pancreas cancer early uh, and the patient gets neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we do a resection with negative margins, and, and, and often the patient is back within a couple years, certainly within five, uh, with recurrent disease. So these IPMNs are very interesting because it may be an opportunity uh, to, to uh, act ahead of time and actually cure the patient. So uh, we'll go through this a little bit. The, the plan is to um, uh, briefly kind of go over the disease and, and what the current topics are. Uh, and then from there, uh, we'll go through some real cases. So the, and these are actual cases uh, that we've seen uh, here. So uh, IPMN is a papillary uh, neoplasm. Uh, the, the one that's most concerning is within the main pancreatic duct. And Dr. Uh, Fisher, maybe we can get you to share your slides um, as we get going. Yes, that would be a good idea. There you go. How about now? Great. We've got okay. you up and going. Great. Thanks, George, for the reminder there. So, uh, you know, this, this view on the top right is uh, a view of the pancreatic duct itself. And you can see those little bumps, those papillary projections that are secreting mucin into the duct. It can cause dilation of the pancreatic duct. And sometimes uh, the patient will present 
very similar to chronic pancreatitis. Uh, this disease ranges from pre-malignant to invasive malignant uh, cancer. Uh, the disease spreads along the duct, but it's usually slow to begin to invade and, and then metastasize. So there's opportunity. So here's what I'm talking about with the chance for cure. So if you look at this curve, uh, this is the survival curve of, of pancreas cancer. Um, and this is from a study where they looked at patients with stage one disease, so very early cancer, um, that were either offered surgery or not offered surgery. And you can see if stage one patients don't get surgery, their survival curve is very similar to stage three or stage four pancreas cancer. The, the survival curve above that uh, is, is when patients get treated with chemotherapy and radiation. And as we all know, it's about a 50% two, two year and a 25% five year survival. So the red arrows, that's where we live as pancreas surgeons, at least with pancreas cancer, that's what we're doing. That's the benefit we're providing. But if you think about these IPMNs, if you prevent them uh, from getting to that cancer stage, this is the survival. What you see in the blue arrows, that's, that's what you're achieving uh, by resection of an IPMN. So a much greater benefit uh, when we consider the risk benefit ratio in the preoperative setting. So something to keep in mind um, as we think about this disease. So uh, the incidence of this is pretty high. It, this is fairly common, particularly in the elderly. Um, there's a study uh, looking at about 3000 uh, CT scans on subjects that did not have anything known to be wrong with their pancreas. Uh, they were getting the scan for some other reason. Almost 3% had a pancreas cyst and a lot of these are IPMNs. And if you look at the, the octogenarians, almost 9% of them uh, had a cyst in their pancreas. So Dr. Van Buren and I spend a lot of time in our office seeing patients with pancreas cysts, and we have to sift out which ones uh, are important, uh, a high risk, and which ones need to come out, and which ones don't. So these patients are frequently asymptomatic and incidentally discovered. Uh, but if they do have symptoms from IPMN, they usually present with abdominal pain, maybe nausea, vomiting, sometimes steatorrhea because they're, they're not uh, producing enough pancreas juice, and then they'll have weight loss. And when the disease is very advanced, they'll have obstruction of the bile duct and present with jaundice. Some present with recurrent pancreatitis, uh, and that could be confusing. This is the classic fisheye deformity uh, as seen on ERCP. So this is a view from inside the duodenum looking at the ampulla of Vater. And you can see this mucin uh, coming out of, the, out of the duct. Here's another shot of it that really looks like a, just like a fish eye. Um, so that's kind of pathognomonic of IPMN when, when you see that mucin coming out of the duct. And on ERCP, this is what it looks like. Uh, you'll see a diffusely dilated pancreatic duct with mucin filling defects along it. Um, the, uh, and if there are, there are uh, side branch cysts, they'll communicate with the main duct. Uh, you won't see the calcifications throughout the duct that you'd usually see with chronic calcific pancreatitis. So here are some, some other examples, and we need to differentiate the, the side branch type versus the main duct type uh, of uh, IPMN. So IPMN can also originate in the side branches, the little branches that feed the main pancreatic duct, often in the uncinate process in the head of the pancreas, but it can occur in the distal pancreas too. These patients are often asymptomatic and they got their CAT scan for some other reason. Now it's important to, to distinguish these two because branch duct has a much lower incidence of cancer, about 15% versus 42% in the main duct type. So it's more reasonable to follow branch duct type, especially if it's a small branch duct cyst and particularly in elderly poor operative candidates. One word of caution though, is that you can have mixed uh, picture with main duct and side branch type. Uh, and also you can have a dilated main pancreatic duct in the setting of pure side branch IPMN from mucin getting into the main duct, but you don't actually have uh, IPMN disease in the main duct. So the radiology and the histology, they, they may not uh, overlap completely. So you can see in the picture here at the top, these little side branches, but you've got a dilated main duct. Uh, in the middle panel, a big side branch IPMN and a normal sized pancreatic duct, and then the bottom panel, the mixed duct type. 
So what's the risk of cancer? Well, this is not easy to really get a handle on because uh, you know we don't if we take them out, we, they don't progress to cancer, and there hasn't been a lot of really large prospective cohort studies. So we have to take the information from case series. And they're usually pretty small case series in the literature of 50 patients or so. Uh, but, but this is kind of what we know. So the, uh, in one series, 30% were branch ducts, 70% were um, uh, IPMN main duct type. There was invasive cancer in 37% of the main duct type carcinoma in situ in 20%. In the branch duct, no invasive cancer, um, and 15% had carcinoma in situ. Uh, in another similar size series, uh, similar findings with no cancer in the branch duct type if it was less than uh, three centimeters and no mural nodule. And from seven other recent series, uh, you know, it, it kind of comes out to be about the, the same numbers. So to best we can tell, uh, main duct type much more worrisome than side branch. So main duct type usually means resection. Uh, we know that maybe 60 or, or percent or so are going to either have carcinoma in situ or high grade dysplasia uh, or, act, or even an invasive cancer. So most of the time in a fit operative candidate, we're going to take these out. Um, the, the resection is often a Whipple procedure uh, since the head of the pancreas is often involved. And we'll often need to get frozen sections or even do pancreatic ductoscopy uh, to make sure that we're removing all of the disease in IPMN main duct type. Uh, sometimes an extended or a total pancreatectomy might be uh, necessary to remove all the disease. The good news is, is that the five-year survival is near 100% when we resect non-malignant IPMNs. Um, the survival is 60% when there is some malignancy, which is much better than regular pancreas cancer that's not found in the setting of IPMN. So here's a picture uh, from the operating room. And, and just to orient you, the patient's head's at the top, feet are at the bottom. Uh, we have this uh, clamp under the neck of the pancreas, and you can see the superior mesenteric vein there down at the bottom, portal vein above. And we're beginning to divide the neck of the pancreas, and you can see this bead of mucin coming from the main uh, pancreatic duct, uh, just kind of classic for uh, IPMN. So in this case, uh, the margin at the neck uh, was positive for uh, high-grade dysplasia. So we had to dissect further into the body of the pancreas. So you see here the celiac axis with the hepatic artery and the splenic artery. Here's the splenoportal confluence. And uh, we had to dissect up and take more uh, of the pancreas. And here you see a more normal pancreatic duct. Um, where we ended the resection. So the, the branch duct type doesn't always mean resection, and, and often it doesn't mean resection. So many, if not most, of the branch duct IPMNs are, are relatively harmless, and, and the risks associated with the surgery usually outweigh the benefit of resecting these particularly small branch uh, IPMNs. These often occur in very elderly patients uh, who aren't great candidates for surgery, and the annual rate of progression is actually pretty low, you know, on the order of about 5%. Um, so for asymptomatic patients with small, less than three centimeter side branch IPMNs, no duct dilation, no mural nodules, we usually follow those. But for symptomatic patients with bigger lesions, uh, particularly associated with any high risk stigmata or worrisome features, uh, we're gonna take those out. Uh, a word of caution about the three centimeter cutoff, uh, there's been some reports where that's really not a good uh, thing to go with. And sometimes we will resect a branch duct IPMN less than three centimeters, particularly in a fit candidate uh, where there's been growth or some other uh, concerning feature. So there, there was an important um, consensus conference in uh, Fukuawa, Japan, uh, a few years, a number of years back now, uh, that gave us some really good guide guidelines. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about these high risk stigmata. Uh, so, jaundice. Uh, an enhancing solid component or a main duct greater than 10, those patients are going to go to surgery. If they don't have that, uh, then we look for uh, pancreatitis, a cyst greater than three centimeters, thickened enhancing cyst walls, main duct five to nine, uh, a non-enhancing mural nodule, or an abrupt change in the caliber of the, of the duct with distal atrophy. If they have those things, then they go on to get further evaluation with ultrasound where we're again looking for a mural nodule, 
or any features that might suggest that we actually have main duct disease and not side branch disease, or if we have cytology that's suspicious or even positive for malignancy, then they go to surgery. If not, then depending on the size of the cyst, we're gonna do surveillance. So in a very small side branch IPMN with no high risk stigmata or worrisome features, we're gonna usually follow those. And we usually follow with MRI uh, in about two to three years, uh, every two to three years. In the one to two range, we're gonna step that up and, and we're gonna do yearly surveillance for two years and then lengthen it. And then if they're in the two to three range, we're gonna go ahead and get the EUS in three to six months, uh, alternating with MRI. Consider surgery in a young fit candidate. Uh, and then greater than three, we get a little more worried with these people uh, and do even closer surveillance with, uh, with uh, the EUS and uh, you know, more, more strongly consider surgery. So what, here's some examples of what you're looking for, these high-risk stigmata. This is an example uh, of a mural nodule. You can see here a pretty big five millimeter mural nodule inside of this uh, cyst on ultrasound. Um, here's cases where the main pancreatic duct is very dilated, 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, that's a, that's a high-risk stigmata and uh, indicative of uh, main duct involvement and uh, higher risk of cancer and of course jaundice. Here's some examples of worrisome features. Uh, here you see a mural nodule on, in this cyst that's enhancing with contrast. Um, and here you see a, a, a septation within the cyst that's enhancing with uh, contrast. And here you have pancreas uh, atrophy uh, in, in association with the cyst. So those things, any evidence of lymphadenopathy and elevated CA199 or a rapid growth rate greater than five millimeters in two years uh, would all be things that would be worrisome and kind of tip us over. Uh, we also have genetic testing now on the cells that we aspirate from the cyst, and that can also help us a little bit in the decision making. There was a recent uh, revision of the Sendai criteria. Uh, bottom line is that they didn't change much uh, in, in terms of what uh, the Fukuawa criteria were. Uh, but you know, the, the, age, the American Gastroenterological Association in 2015 came out with some pretty uh, different guidelines that were, were much more stringent uh, in, in, uh, against surgery and even stopping surveillance. Uh, but this, so this is an area of controversy. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a balance between over-treatment and, and, and not missing an opportunity to, to prevent pancreas cancer. Uh, so we do need to be careful. And I would say, you know, Dr. Van Buren and I are probably taking out less cysts than we did 10 years ago. But um, these are certainly an opportunity and certainly represent a pretty good portion of the resections that we do. So it's really all about preoperative decision making. Um, the, the resection is indicated in surgically fit patients with main duct IPMN. Um, and usually um, uh, if there's high grade dysplasia at the margin, we're gonna take more um, until we get until there's no uh, you know, carcinoma in situ uh, left behind. With the branched up duct type, less than three centimeters, no high risk stigmata or worrisome features, we're usually gonna do surveillance for that. Uh, although in a younger patient uh, with a smaller cyst, uh, we may consider surgery because that's a, you know, there may be a long time, you know, particularly if they're very young, that you're gonna have to do surveillance and worry about uh, that changing. Uh, so, uh, Although the cyst size itself is indicative of, of cancer being in there, there's really no uh, particular cutoff uh, that's, that's a safe thing to hang your hat on. Um, the, uh, the clinical management uh, has to, it can't really be carried out based on one thing. So it's really a, a, a synthesis of a lot of information that you get from a CAT scan, an MRI, uh, an EUS, uh, cytology, pathology, uh, and then considering the patient factors um, in terms of their risk of surgery. Um, so it, it's really a, a multidisciplinary decision uh, often uh, when we take care of these patients. Um, so what operation do we usually do for IPMN? The, the aim is resection to achieve complete removal of the tumor with a negative margin. So uh, when you have segmental or an ectatic type uh, with diffuse focal lesions, uh, mural nodules or branch duct lesions, uh, it's relatively easy to determine whether you need to do a Whipple or a distal uh, in that setting. 
Um, in, in the diffuse dilation type without a focal lesion, then it gets a little more um, difficult to decide. And in some cases, we'll, we'll do further workup with ERCP to help us decide which part of the pancreas needs to come out. Um, with main duct involving the middle segment of the pancreas, we would usually do a Whipple uh, because it's technically easier to extend the margin uh, uh, or, or come back if you have to in a case like that. Uh, with multifocal branch duct, what we do is, is often a segmental resection uh, of the lesions that are at highest risk. So you can see this case where uh, there's a bunch of little side branch um, um, lesions, but the worrisome one is in the head. So in a case like this, we'd do a Whipple and we'd just go ahead and leave those smaller side branch lesions in the patient and do surveillance of those uh, because um, making the patient a brittle diabetic with a total pancreatectomy is probably higher risk for them than just monitoring these smaller side branch uh, lesions. We will sometimes rely on frozen section and even intraoperative pancreatic ductoscopy, although now we're leaning a little more towards spy, preoperative spyglass endoscopy. Uh, so this, this is helpful to us and it's important to have an expert pathologist available uh, at the time of surgery. Um, High-grade dysplasia at the margin, we'll, we'll usually do additional resection. Low-grade dysplasia at the margin, we usually will not. Um, if there are obvious papillary nodules present that you can see at the margin, then we would do additional resection for that as well. Uh, but we're pretty selective about doing the, the um, you know, a total pancreatectomy, um, unless it's a, you know, kind of a younger fit patient that can really handle uh, the post-op setting uh, in dealing with the diabetes. Um, so uh, here's an example of intraoperative pancreatic ductoscopy. Uh, we use a small uh, scope that'll fit down the dilated pancreatic duct uh, so we can explore the, the, the part of the pancreas that we're leaving behind. Uh, on the left, you can see what it looks like when there's remaining disease. You can see these little papillary projections into the lumen uh, of the pancreatic duct, um, and they'll be kind of waving in the breeze as the fluid flows through there. And then you, know, you get out to a more normal area and the pancreatic duct looks smooth and normal um, where there's no IPMN disease. This is a picture of the, of the scope that our gastroenterologists have now. So it's a, a mother-daughter scope where the small scope can be placed through the regular ERCP scope and then advanced right out into the pancreatic duct. And they can even do biopsies of, of papilla and get us samples and and help us determine you know, which part of the pancreas is, is at higher risk, if, if not all of it. So a word about surveillance after resection. Uh, patients who undergo resection for IPMN uh, that do not have invasive cancer are cured typically, but we know that IPMN can be multi in multiple locations and they do remain at risk for developing a second lesion. So we do recommend surveillance of these patients. Uh, so in the absence of any known residual lesions, we repeat the MRI at two years and five years. Um, if there's any low or moderate grade dysplasia, then we step that up and we get it about every six months, at least for the first uh, uh, few years. Um, patients with surgically resected IPMN um, that, that don't have invasive cancer, they're, they're usually cured more than 95% of the time. Um, uh, but if there is invasive cancer, the prognosis is obviously much worse, and those patients need uh, adjuvant therapy and, and very close follow-up. Um, so uh, dedicated MRCP is probably the, the procedure of choice uh, for evaluating the uh, pancreatic cyst uh, 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 and, and nodules. Uh, and then follow-up MRI uh, has the advantage, advantage of avoiding radiation exposure. So that's really our, our go-to uh, modality. Um, there's also the risk of other cancers, uh, other GI cancers or lung cancer. So that is something to keep in mind uh, that they need to be screened for that as well. Uh, there are different subtypes to the, the intestinal and, and gastric type, pancreatic or biliary type. Uh, I won't uh, belabor those, but the pancreatic or biliary are uh, more of a bad actor. So I'm gonna kind of change gears now and, and uh, we'll go through some real cases that hopefully this will be interesting. Uh, and maybe Dr. Van Buren and I can have a little back and forth uh, about uh, what we would do. 
So here's a case for you. So here's a 73 year old female. She's got a history of morbid obesity, sleep apnea, diabetes and hypertension, uh, anemia. She's got two large ventral hernias uh, previously repaired with mesh. Uh, and she comes in for a surgical opinion regarding two asymptomatic pancreatic cysts. Now, interestingly, her sister passed away recently from pancreas cancer, and she knows that these cysts uh, can, can lead to pancreas cancer, so she's very worried about that. So she had a CAT scan, and we followed that up with an EUS, and it showed uh, about a 2.5 by 2.3 centimeter cyst in the body of the pancreas with three compartments, and then another cyst in the head of the pancreas with a single compartment, no mural nodule, no solid component, uh, no, no main pancreatic duct dilation and no atrophy of the pancreas. They did aspirate some fluid, uh, which was mucinous, and they sent it off for genetic testing, and she had a low clonality uh, GNAS uh, mutation uh, in both of these cysts, uh, and as well as a KRAS mutation in, in one of them. CA99 on the fluid was elevated uh, in both of the cysts. So, you know, I think Dr. Van Buren and I would agree that this is a, this is a cyst that's, uh, although less than three centimeters, concerning given the family history and uh, the genetic mutations, um, but certainly not a great operative candidate. Here's a picture of the, the patient. You can, you can see what she looks like. Uh, and here's a picture of one of the cysts uh, in the head of the pancreas uh, when, where one of the bigger ones was. So uh, what I actually did with this patient is uh, we discussed non-operative options. We had an experimental program at our center with uh, RFA ablation. Uh, we didn't think that was probably the best thing for her, uh, although we talked about it. I asked her to lose weight and she came back uh, about 20 pounds lighter. I sent her back out. She came back and lost uh, about a total of 30 pounds. Um, so after much kind of debate. Uh, at that point, uh, I decided to take her to the operating room. Uh, and we did a Whipple procedure. We repaired her ventral hernia. Uh, she ended up going to a skilled nursing facility after a six-day stay, but had an uneventful recovery. Um, she ended up having a, a greater than three centimeter branch duct IPMN. Uh, it was gastric type. Uh, and uh, there was some low-grade dysplasia, but no high-grade dysplasia uh, or cancer. So um, maybe George, we can talk about that case a little bit. So I know you you follow a lot of these patients too, um, and uh, you know it's a balance between uh, worrying about the risk of developing cancer uh, versus the risk of of surgery. Um, yeah, in, in that one, I think you know the, there's a couple of interesting components. First of all, it's always very interesting when we see the pathology, uh, which meets uh, a different uh, you know, measurements uh, readout on that is different than uh, the preoperative uh, readouts. And you know, one of the challenges is the literature that we've looked at is so often based on pathologic specimens, right? When they've studied these people retrospectively, they have that tumor that shows that that's been cut out. And that's a, on your pathology, it's a 3.5 centimeter specimen Preoperative imaging, the one of the biggest challenges I think with it is, you know, different slices, different imaging modalities, CT scan, MRI. Are you looking at a cluster of uh, these cysts? Are you looking at a single cyst? Is it you know multiple cysts? Uh, and so you know I think those components to it really do add some nuances to discussion. And, and I think um, a big component of also what you added to the discussion is not simply just size and mural nodules, uh, but the um, analysis of the fluid, um, both with uh, CEA and some of the genetic analysis of it. And I think that is really one of the areas for growth that we all talked about so much is how do we improve that testing? Yeah, you know, one of the things that pushed me in this case, and, and um, I'm sure that other people on the call uh, would be interested to, to hear about some, some kind of insight that you don't necessarily read in a textbook, but uh, she was so nervous about, uh, with her sister having, having lived through her sister uh, getting pancreas cancer, um, her quality of life was very negatively impacted by uh, worrying about this cyst. And uh, I know 
sometimes when I'm doing surveillance in patients, some, some of my patients, uh, they're totally fine with it. And they, they would almost not even come back if you told them not to worry about it. And then others, they get so uh, nervous about it. And it's a big workup when they're coming in for their MRI. They, they, it's a lot of emotion. And does that factor into your decision-making sometimes about when we go forward and take it out or not? I think so. I mean, I think so much of um, you know, the doctor-patient interaction is uh, us reading them and them also reading us. And as much as we try and uh, many times reassure uh, patients or couch it to them of there is a risk, but you know, we, we think it's uh, a you know, fairly minimal risk on them. Um, sometimes that component of uh, the concern, the anxiety about that cyst is very real. Uh, and in other folks, it can be also difficult to differentiate the symptoms that they are have, some of the vague symptoms that are present from these cysts. And so I think those are the really challenging things for us to uh, delve out. You know, are they having some episodes of abdominal pain from this? Is there an episode of pancreatitis that's coming from this? You know, what is contributing to this? And so I think those add to a lot of anxiety to the patients as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I haven't had the experience y yet, and I, I hope I don't of of uh, recommending surveillance, further surveillance, and having somebody come back with an invasive cancer. You know, you hate as a, as a you know you'd hate to have them come back. You know, I thought you were an expert pancreas surgeon, and you know, you here we sat on this thing, and now I have invasive incurable cancer. What a what a horrible situation. So you you don't want to err on the side of uh, you know failing to act, but, but we also don't want to be too aggressive and, and hurt people with resections that they, they don't need because obviously uh, all of us in this field know that a pancreas resection is not a benign uh, operation. So it's kind of a tricky area, um, you know, and, and, and that's why we're talking about it tonight, I guess. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's look at another case. Um, so here's a, a 68 year old woman uh, with an unremarkable past medical history, other than some high blood pressure and a right bundle branch block. So she actually presented for, a, for something unrelated. She had hematuria and the urologist got a CT uh, with renal stone protocol and incidentally identified some abnormalities in the pancreas. So uh, it showed parenchymal atrophy of the pancreas and some moderate dilation of, of the duct, uh, main duct, which was tortuous uh, out in the tail. Uh, so uh, they were referred to us and when we got an MRI. Uh, so this shows this uh, duct out in the tail uh, with it's very dilated uh, and tortuous. You can see here, uh, very abnormal looking uh, pancreas duct. Um, but it, and it's in the tail, which is a little, a little uh, strange. So uh, pronounced main and side branch dilation of the tail uh, and, and uh, involving about a four and a half centimeter length with some associated parenchymal atrophy. Didn't necessarily see a mass there, uh, but the, the pre-op uh, consideration was uh, main duct and side duct branch duct uh, IPMN. Um, there uh, was a little smaller cystic focus more proximally in the, in the neck, um, uh, which we thought was a side branch. So patient got EUS and, and showed, uh, again, dilated appearance in the tail uh, nine millimeter um, uh, cyst identified in the pancreatic body, communicating with the main pancreatic duct. Uh, no high risk stigma or worrisome features. And so, so that was consistent with a, um, uh, a side branch IPMN. Uh, and then a multi-cystic lesion in, identified out in the tail, uh, measuring more than three centimeters. Uh, and um, uh, you know, again, probably a mixed uh, main duct uh, side branch uh, type uh, situation. So in this patient, we did a uh, robotic assisted laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. Uh, patient did well, went home uh, on day two, and this showed a, a three centimeter IPMN with some uh, low grade dysplasia in this case. And it did turn out to be um, mixed uh, main duct branch duct type, gastric type, uh, with no uh, high grade dysplasia. There was some uh, pan in at the margin, uh, and we are following this patient, of course, since she had main duct uh, disease uh, with serial uh, MRI. So uh, maybe, George, we should comment a little bit about uh, laparoscopic approach uh, in these cases. 
um, uh, we've been doing uh, most of our distal pancreatectomies with a laparoscopic approach. Uh, and uh, honestly, we could probably send the patient home the next day, but we usually keep them overnight uh, to the following uh, morning. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, all of us would agree um, that I think the minimally invasive approach, uh, especially for the distal pancreatectomies, has become uh, the standard of care and the large bulk and the majority of the um, cases uh, are done in that fashion, especially uh, for the cystic lesions. Um, you know, the, the, always the million dollar question for these things gets to be, you should never change your criteria or change your um, uh, threshold for operating on people based on you know, the ease of an operation or the uh, ability to do it. But there's no question in our minds um, that you know, a higher risk or a, a moderate risk, risk lesion at the tail versus a moderate risk, risk lesion at the head we are going to approach it differently because the morbidity of that operation uh, for that person, although not nothing, you know, is significantly less um, for this. Um, it, one of the interesting components of something that you brought about the tail lesions, though, which I always find challenging is uh, you kind of mentioned that that component of main ductal dilatation that's associated with that. And one of the challenges I always find with the tail lesions gets to be um, a, is that mucin contributing to some dilation of that tail uh, main duct that's extending over? Or B, are you, you know, missing it? You know, how far do you go over uh, on that tail if there's some dilation of that duct that's associated with that? So is that main duct disease or is it mucin uh, that's driving some of that? And that's one of the challenging parts, I think, of the distal pancreatectomy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where that, you know, and, and obviously harder to do uh, intraoperative pancreatic ductoscopy on a distal, um, you know, because it's not proceeding in anastomosis. And that's where that preoperative um, spyglass endoscopy can come in uh, handy. But yeah, I would agree that uh, the, the risk benefit ratio, uh, you know, the, that, that weighing of the risk of surgery versus the benefit um, is a, is a different sort of analysis when the lesion is in the tail and involves a distal as opposed to a lesion in the head. But that said, you know, even a distal pancreatectomy is a real operation. And even though we're doing it minimally invasively and most of the time they go home the next day, uh, we all know that it, it doesn't always go that way. So uh, need to be particularly careful, particularly in an older patient that has a whole lot of comorbidities, so. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, let's let's see this one. This is a male this time, 52 year old, um, no real medical history other than hyperlipidemia, uh, presented with abdominal pain. Uh, so they started with uh, looking for common things, right upper quadrant ultrasound, and they see a dilated duct. Uh, that's followed up with cross-sectional imaging and, and an ERCP uh, uh, endoscopy and EUS. And the patient had a double duct sign. Uh, had mucin coming from the major papilla, like the picture that we showed earlier, uh, and that raised concern for uh, main duct IPMN. The main duct was greater than 10 centimeters um, and also had a little dilation of the bile duct. Um, didn't see any primary tumor, any mass that could be seen, uh, but they, they happened to do spyglass endoscopy in this case, and it, and it showed um, and no severe dysplasia or cancer on, on biopsies, but there was a stricture uh, within the PD and the head of the pancreas. So this one's kind of a no-brainer in terms of needing surgery uh, because it's a fit candidate and it's obviously main duct IPMN with high-risk stigmata. Uh, so here's, here's what the duct looked like out in the body, uh, you know, pretty dilated out here. Uh, and as you come over towards the head, you see this dilated duct uh, anterior to the portal vein uh, coming on down into the head, even more, more di dilated and even on into the uncinate. So this patient got a Whipple procedure and in, intraoperatively they had high grade dysplasia at the neck on frozen. So of course we took more, uh, resected in, extended the resection into the body of the pancreas. Uh, he ended up doing well, uh, pretty unremarkable post-op course, went home on day three with his drains out uh, and did well. The final pathology showed a, a mixed main duct branch duct type and he, he did have carcinoma in situ, high-grade dysplasia in the specimen, um, but no invasive cancer. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately rather, there was no high-grade dysplasia at the, 
uh, final margin after we took it over more into the body. Now, what about this patient? We're not done here, right? So uh, we left in some of the body of the pancreas, and this was a case of IPMN with uh, high-grade dysplasia. So this patient needs uh, surveillance. Uh, so they're coming back now with MRI, with MRCP, um, and, uh, and it ha has since shown a, a less dilated residual pancreatic duct out there in the remaining body and tail of the pancreas. Um, and, uh, you know, we're following this patient uh, closely, um, but we think that that's the safe thing to do, uh, the better thing to do rather than a total pancreatectomy. So here's the surveillance image on the same patient. You can see this remaining body and tail, and, you know, the pancreatic duct is more towards a normal size, but there's a little, little side branch uh, uh, dilation there that we're following now. Um, so I'm going to give you one last case. Um, I think this is the last one. This is a 64-year-old woman, uh, history of just hypertension and high cholesterol. She happens to have ulcerative colitis too, uh, and presented with abdominal pain, weight loss, and diarrhea. Uh, her pain was mid-epigastric, kind of dull pain. She gets a CAT scan, uh, but shortly after the CAT scan, she started having bad uh, diarrhea. Uh, she at first thought it was due to the contrast, uh, but actually had blood in her stool. So she went for a colonoscopy and she was having a flare of uh, ulcerative colitis and she got started on prednisone uh, and mesalamine and, and this uh, was effective treatment for her, her UC. Uh, so uh, her, her, she presented with abdominal pain, which we thought was probably re more related to her UC uh, as well as the weight loss and, and the diarrhea. Um, so, um, after the, when she was treated with the steroids, we brought her back later uh, and got another CAT scan to follow up. And it showed um, some multiple well-circumscribed low attenuation cysts in the head of her pancreas. Uh, the biggest one was less than uh, three centimeters. You can see it here in the head. Um, it was 2.6. Uh, given that size criteria in the Fukuawa uh, scheme, we sent her for EUS. Uh, this did show uh, cysts in the head of the pancreas. The biggest one was, uh, you know, about two and a half centimeters. No associated mass, no bile duct dilation, no lymphadenopathy, no uh, main duct dilation. It was only two millimeters normal uh, throughout the pancreas. They, they did do FNA on the big cyst, and they got eight cc's of fluid out of it. Um, and there wasn't anything on the cytology uh, that had us concerned. So uh, we recommended surveillance, actually, in this case, uh, and followed the patient along. She came back in a year for her follow-up MRI, and now the cyst had gotten bigger. You can see it here. It's gotten, now it's bigger than three centimeters. Uh, and the radiologist also commented on a, a small mural nodule uh, that they thought might be developing. So given the growth of the cyst and the potential mural nodule, uh, we recommended resection uh, in this patient. So she was taken to surgery, uh, where, well, actually, before we took her to surgery, she had another flare of her ulcerative colitis. Uh, so we treated her again with steroids and let her get over that first. And then when she was completely off her steroids, uh, three months later, uh, we brought her back. Um, and uh, so she still has the cyst in the head, uh, but she had developed uh, some uh, side branches that were dilated out in the body but these were all pretty small. Um, so what we did in this case is we did a Whipple uh, to remove uh, the mass in the head. We did a, this case, we did a robotic Whipple um, and the patient went home on day four. She had a really nice recovery. Um, the final pathology, they measured it at 2.5 uh, and it did, it was a mixed duct uh, type, a mixed main duct uh, and side branch type. And there was some mild dysplasia in it, but no, no severe dysplasia, so no carcinoma in situ. Now we did intentionally leave that body and tail of the pancreas in there with those small side branch lesions. So she's now undergoing uh, surveillance uh, for those lesions. Um, so I think that's the last case. So uh, maybe George, we've got a few remaining minutes, a uh, uh, little over 15, or I guess about 15 minutes. We can maybe take some questions from chat yeah, uh, or, or have some more discussion. Absolutely. So uh, we did, um, Dr. Osornio uh, has sent a uh, 
online question. He is uh, in discussion of um, asking which um, technique uh, do you prefer for your pancreatic jejunostomy? Uh, in terms of, he's asking whether you prefer the modified Bloomgart technique with the mattress sutures um, uh, versus other techniques. And uh, you and I have, I know, discussed this extensively and it's also been researched uh, by others extensively as well. Uh, Bill, I'll kind of let you uh, kind of give your few Yeah, your, it's, few it's cents always in. a lot of fun when you get some pancreas surgeons together to start talking about some of these uh, details of operative technique because there's a lot of passion about it um, and, um, you know, a lot of controversy, honestly. And, and like most things with controversy, there's, you know, probably no perfect answer. But, but I think George is right that uh, there's a lot of data now uh, indicating that the ductum mucosa is better than intussusception. Um, and I think most people are doing an endocide ductum mucosa anastomosis. Um, the, the specific question is about uh, you know, the suturing technique. And uh, I think uh, surgeons who are trained with that modified uh, Bloomgart technique, um, that, that's the way you end up doing it. Um, we, I use uh, interrupted sutures. Um, you know, as we've um, done our homework and training, um, doing more of the um, robotic Whipple procedures, uh, in, in those cases now I, I've gone to using the, the uh, modified Bloomgart technique. Uh, many of the cases that we've chosen for um, robotic Whipple have had a soft pancreas and it, and it just seems a little easier tying sutures robotically to me uh, using that Bloomgart technique. But I I haven't changed to using that open, um, just really probably out of habit. Uh, and uh, again, you know, like Dr. Van Buren said, I don't think there's a lot of data for uh, those sutures versus the interrupted in terms of outcome, in terms of pancreatic leak. Um, there's a lot of, you know, million things have been looked at, uh, you know, in terms of uh, stenting, internal stenting versus external stenting, uh, use of, um, uh, you know, glue uh, on top and, um, you know, use of octreotide uh, and on and on. Um, most, uh, I think uh, there's some emerging data at least to suggest uh, that, uh, you know, duct to mucosa um, uh, is, is, is really one thing that's key um, uh, in terms of technique uh, uh, that is a little bit better. But uh, the data on other things is really kind of out. Um, I know um, uh, some of our colleagues uh, in, in a huge uh, retrospective data with thousands of resections have, uh, have uh, shown that that data kind of indicates that uh, getting away from using octreotide and any glue or things like that, because uh, that's associated, at least in those retrospective studies, with more uh, leak and worse outcome. But um, yeah, I think in terms of the suturing technique, if you got something that's working for you really well and your leak rate is 10% or less, uh, you're probably going to be pretty reluctant to, to change your ways. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, the key to that. I uh, recently looked at uh, all this for a review from one of the landmark studies for uh, the Annals of Surgical Oncology. Uh, and as you know, when we've partnered with uh, Dr. Volmer and, and our colleagues, as you said, in sort of large retrospective reviews, um, a, when you talk to people about these things, there is no right way or wrong way. And there have been randomized controlled trials to support one way and randomized controlled trials to support other ways. And so um, I think as Dr. Fisher is saying, you know, you've, I think consistency is really important uh, in this and, and uh, having some uh, fundamentals in the techniques of that. That being said, we do always want to develop and change. And sometimes we go visit our colleagues in uh, one location versus another location, and we see something different, and we say, hey, that's a neat trick. Maybe I'll integrate that into my practice. And so it's a balancing act of, um, you know, working with the techniques that brought us uh, the success that we've had over the years versus uh, continually trying to innovate and develop our practice and modify and improve. Uh, and so there's always that tension that exists uh, with us as, as pancreas surgeons, I think, as all surgeons. Uh, but a, a great question, and as Dr. Fisher was saying you could probably uh, get a room of uh, folks going back and forth on that discussion uh, for an extended period of time. So, well, um, overall, uh, I think this has been a, a really um, great discussion uh, that we've had uh, so far. 
uh, on um, uh, this whole uh, IPMN as well as all the nuances of the operative uh, techniques for it. it it's always uh, a very sort of uh, tough decision on some of these patients uh, that we have to make, but uh, it, it's really been uh, a, a very informative uh, discussion. Um, before we finish, uh, I would like to recognize and acknowledge um, several of the entities um, that we're going to put up on the screen here that have supported our partnership um, here uh, at Baylor College of Medicine and Baylor St. Luke's uh, with these international programs. Um, it has been uh, really great um, to partner with several of these groups. Uh, prior to COVID, we had the opportunity uh, to travel uh, down to uh, Mexico uh, and Latin America and really had some great partnerships that we built uh, over the years. And uh, unfortunately, in the COVID world, we've um, been having to do these uh, teleconferences. And we look forward to uh, the day when we can all travel again and uh, sort of interact with our international colleagues again. But we do appreciate uh, all of the support um, from all of the groups who have worked with us over the years. Uh, in addition, um, I do uh, want to uh, announce that we will be having a, a advanced lung disease conference um, as our uh, next uh, live uh, streaming version. And we certainly hope uh, that everybody here today who has any interest in lung disease uh, will be able to uh, come. This will be led by Gabe Lohr, who's uh, one of the premier lung transplant surgeons in the country, who's here at Baylor St. Luke's and he has done an amazing job. And so he will be leading uh, that discussion there. So we think that should be really exciting and, and hopefully informative for everybody who logs in. And uh, with that, uh, I, I think we will uh, conclude. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher, uh, for uh, providing your time and insight. And thank you for all of our participants uh, who logged in and spent the time uh, listening to us and, and providing your insights as well.